In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another good, good amen. amen. Almighty God, we thank you for your people. Thank you for your children, for your servants. We thank you because of this work you put in our hands. And we pray, Lord, every one of us will prosper in the work in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prosper spiritually, physically and naturally, and our families will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we pray that in every direction, everything you committed into our hands, personal, professional, ministry, family, everything will move forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Rebuke the adversary. Amen. Keep your people free. Amen. And let your goodness be multiplied in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that tonight you speak to every one of us. Amen. You move everyone forward. Amen. That Lord will make progress in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Watch over your people. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you real good. I thought you will say another amen. amen. Today we are coming to John chapter 4. What a story we have here. And what revelation we have here in John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 25. John chapter 4 verse 25. And the woman says unto him. That means the woman at the well spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ. Saying, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. He said, I know the Lord is coming. I know the Christ is coming. I know the Messiah is coming. The Savior is coming. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. What a surprise for her to hear. In verse 26, Jesus says unto her, I that speak unto thee. Tell me, I'm he. And tonight we're considering soul winning. And we're considering passion for soul winning. The topic is living with Christ-like passion for soul winning. Living. Not just that you labor once in a while. Not just that you witness once in a while. It becomes a lifestyle. Like it was with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what Jesus Christ seeking the lost and saving the lost was a lifestyle pattern. It wasn't something he just did when there was a special program on a Saturday evening, on a Sunday afternoon, or what she did when there was a lot of encouragement, a lot of motivation. He did it every time. He lived with passion, and he lived with purpose. Under opposition, he preached. Under persecution, he kept on preaching. Under weariness or in hunger or thirst, he kept on preaching. There were times he was tired, physically tired. There were times he was exhausted. And yet, he kept on preaching. And that's what we need to learn. So that the life of Jesus Christ will be translated into your life, into my life. It will happen. That we will also wake up and understand that that is what we are living for and we are living with passion. If you look at the chapter from the beginning, I'm, I'm coming to chapter 4 and verse 4. John chapter 4 verse 4. There is a short sentence here. It says, and he must needs go through Samaria. He saw what his disciples did not see. He knew what his disciples did not know. He knew that there was a soul to reach there and there was a must for him. That's why I said he must needs go through Samaria. I want you to look at that word must. He was compelled to do that. He urged to do that. There was a must in his life. I find that in uh, virtually in the Gospels. Look at uh, Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, we're looking for that word must, and you will see uh, the, the must in your own life, the important thing, the essential thing in your own life. Look at this, chapter 4 of Luke, reading from verse 43. And he said unto them, I, tell me, must preach. I must preach the kingdom of God in other cities also. 
That word also means a preach in this city. We must get to the next one. We cannot say because we have done so well here and we've done the great work of God in this city, therefore we cannot do any other. He says we must, uh, he must uh, go to other cities also, for therefore, what's that? Therefore, tell me, am I saying, he knew the purpose of his existence here. Do you know why you are here? And do you know what you are supposed to be living for? Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 13. In Luke chapter 13, we're reading from verse 31, the must, that must be in your life. Because this word must was a central theme, a central word, a central passion, a central drive in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this, chapter 13 of Luke. And I'm reading from verse 31, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, get thee out. And depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. You know, there are people that will uh, tell you there's danger here, there's danger over there. And because of that threat against your life, what are you going to do? That's what he told Jesus. Look at verse 32. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do I do kills today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, was it here? Nevertheless, shout it out. I must work today and tomorrow and the following and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish out of Jerusalem. And then he goes on to talk about Jerusalem uh, because he wanted them to understand that uh, their salvation was near, but their eyes were blinded to the fact. We're looking at uh, chapter 19 of Luke. Luke chapter 19. And I'm reading here from verse 5. Luke chapter 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him uh, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today, today, I must abide at thy house. You see, the, the word that was very central in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the question is, where was he going to abide? In the house of Zacchaeus that day, look at verse 9, and Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's saying that this is why I'm alive. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I must, I must. Look at John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We're reading here from verse 4. In John chapter 9, verse 4, it starts with, I said it starts with, you see, if we're following Jesus Christ, this must be translated into our lives. There must be a compulsion, something compelling you, the Spirit of God compelling you, that you know that whatever you've done in the past and whatever you're doing now, it must be in continuity, it must continue. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. We're looking at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, we're reading from verse 16. John chapter 10. Here we're reading from verse 16. Another sheep I have which are not of this fold. Stop there for a moment. Jesus knew there were still other people that needed to come into the fold. There are many people, they only look at the membership they have. They say, you know, we have a hundred members here and this is wonderful. In this community, this is one of the biggest, one of the most lively churches in the community here. And they are just satisfied with that. But look at Jesus Christ and said, all the sheep I have. And they are not in this fold yet, them also, tell me, 
I must bring. I must bring. He said, there is a must. I must reach out to them. I must search for them. I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And now Jesus transfers that word, translates that word, and gives that word to you and to me until the end of the world. What's the word we're talking about? I said, what's the word we're talking about? Must. Look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. You will always remember this. I said you will always remember this. It says in Mark chapter 13, verse 10, and the gospel, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. That means in this nation and in every nation of the world, this word of God, this glad tidings, this good news, this gospel must be preached before he comes. The true Christian who is saved and sanctified, the true Christian who is converted and consecrated, the true Christian who is purged and pure, the true Christian who is holy and heavenly minded must be like Christ. I will be like Christ. And more and more, by the grace of God, in the practical sense, you will be like Christ more and more in Jesus' name. The message I told you is living with Christ-like passion. Living with Christ-like passion for soul winning. There are three things we're talking about. Number one, the priority of our soul saving Christ. You think about Christ, his savior. Who does he save? He saves, he wants to save every soul. He did it at that time when he was here on earth. He wants to do it through you. He will live through you. He will love through you. He will labor through you. He will save souls through you in Jesus' name. The priority of our soul saving Christ. Number two, the persuasion of the sinner's conscience. The persuasion of the sinner's conscience. When we go out to preach, we must do like Christ. He convinced the people. He persuaded the people. He spoke to the people until they yielded you will have converts. You will have abiding converts. And the people who will get to the kingdom of God through you, they will come in in Jesus' name. The persuasion of the sinner's conscience. Number three, the power of a single conversion. The power of a single conversion. Uh, there are many people that say, well, uh, we are trying a lot and we are doing a lot. And yet, not many people are coming in. Well, thank God for those who are coming in. That's why we're looking at that third point, the power of a single conversion. Point number one, what's that? The priority of our soul winning Christ. We're coming to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7. John chapter 4. And here we're reading from verse 7. We see the life of Christ, the lifestyle of Christ, and the way he actually evangelized. Look at this. Then there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For the disciples were gone away unto the city to buy food, to buy meat. And then says the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. If you read the story from the very first verse, you'll see at this time the Pharisees had heard that Jesus Christ made and baptized more disciples than John. Because of that, jealousy came in, and they were going to persecute him. In spite of persecution, Jesus still was approaching this soul for salvation. That's why we say that Christ lived purposefully. He didn't allow persecution, opposition, hunger, thirst, 
weariness, whatever. He didn't allow that to hinder him. The times we look too much at our own lives. And we say, I'm going through this, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. And because of what we're going through, we think um, when things are a little bit easier, and when things are proper, and when people give in to the gospel, and there's no, not much persecution, then we will preach the gospel. In spite of persecution, Jesus Christ preached the gospel. He lived for something. You must be living for something. He lived for something eternally significant. Think about what you are living for. Is it eternally significant? Food? Food is good. How eternal is that? Clothing, that's wonderful. How eternal is that? Houses, I must build a house, of course. Of course, you need shelter. God will build a house for you in Jesus' name. But how significant eternally is that? Other people, it's politics. And they feel that, well, we must get involved in this or in that. Other people, it's education they concentrate on. Other people, it's secular work they are employing. Other people, it's their personal health. Everything they think about, everything they pray about is about personal health. For others, it is pleasure. It is personal satisfaction. Other people, it's a family, friends, relation. Other people, possession. These are good, but we must remind ourselves they are all temporary. They are all temporary. Is that all you are living for? In 50 years from now, in 100 years from now, how important will your present pursuits be? Think about what you are pursuing, what you are running after. In 100 years from now, how important will they be? Live for something like the Lord Jesus Christ. Something eternally significant so that you will know that although I do this, but my life, the centrality of my life is to do what Jesus did and what Jesus has left me on earth to do. We must eat, eat, and preach. We must work, work, and preach. We must build houses, build, but preach. We must uh, make money, make money, that's all right, but make sure you are preaching. We must get married, yes, but make sure you are preaching. We must labor, yet you must preach. That's saying that whatever else you are doing, this must become central in your very life. And let's look at this, chapter 4, chapter 4 of John. And we're reading from verse 31. Chapter 4 of John, reading from verse 31. In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. He was weary before they left him to buy food. And he was hungry before they left him to buy the food. Now they have bought the food. And they have come. And he's not in a hurry to eat. And they knew how tired he was, how weary he was. And they knew that he was so exhausted when they left him. And now they brought the food. And they said, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have food. I have meat to eat that she know not of. I have something to eat. Something that fills me. Something that satisfies me. Something that replaces the food for me. Therefore said the disciples, one to another, has any man brought him ought to eat? Then look at what Jesus said. And Jesus says unto them, tell me. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And to finish his work. Some people have not started. If you have not started, when are you going to finish? Jesus said, here is my meat. Here is my food. Here is what fills me up. Here is what satisfies my life. Here is what ends all the desires. Here is what satisfies me to do the work of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he began to tell them, say not ye that are yet three months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He's telling us about the urgency of the work. And the days was his passion. It will be your passion. 
In Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 51. Luke chapter 9, and we're reading from verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Steadfastly, steadfastly, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that's what he expects of everyone that will set your face to go uh, to the place where you will do something for the salvation of other people. And that's why Jesus was surprised when uh, somebody said in verse 59, that same chapter 9, verse 59, and he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and do what? Preach the kingdom of God. Obviously, Jesus Christ was saying, It's more important to preach than to bury the dead. It's more important to preach than to work. It's more important to preach than to labor. It's more important to preach than do any other thing. And that's why it said in Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, we're reading from verse 10. It says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, you say that's Christ, that's the Son of Man. But look at verse 13. In verse 13, and he called his ten disciples, his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds. And then said unto them, tell me. Say that again. Say that for yourself. Say that as if you are going to do it. Occupy till I come. And when he said occupy till I come, what did he mean? He said, what I'm doing, do that until I come. As I reach out and run after those sinners, you do that as well and occupy until I come. Occupy till I come. Are we allowed to retire? Somebody there? Are we allowed to retire? Are we allowed to take a vacation? Are we allowed to say we pass it on to other people? See, my brother, I've been doing this thing for 10 years. I've been doing this thing for 15 years. And these people who are younger, who can, uh, you know, run faster than I am. Okay, I pass it on to you now. I will sit down here. And then you'll be bringing your results back to me. Somebody there, is that allowed? Tell me that word again. Occupy until I come. You'll be obedient in Jesus' name. And whatever is happening, this will be your attitude. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And we're reading here from verse 24. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. And we're reading from verse 24. But none of these things move me. Can we say that together? I think about uh, all the news we're hearing. I hear this news, I hear that news, I hear that news. And then our response is, tell me. From our families, your extended family in the village, they came and they said, have you heard there's going to be this uh, family meeting, this family meeting, that family meeting, and we have evangelism, and we need to bind our hands, our hearts, and everything we've got together, and you happen to be a leader. If you are not there, they will, will not know that your family called you, and, uh, and they came to tell you that this holiday period, see, these uh, three days, our family has decided that this is what they're going to do. And you know that you yourself, uh, you made the announcement or you had the announcement that we're going to go out for evangelism and say, what am I going to do now? What are you going to do? You're going to do a Bible. I said, you are going to do what's in the Bible. And what's in the Bible, when they say this, this, and this, tell me out loud. None of these things say, move me. It just happens that, you know, they say that, uh, you know, there's no money now. They are not paying salary to this, to this, and to that. And, uh, you know, many people are looking for other avenues and other ways. They're still keeping their job because they feel that one day, one day, all the salary arrears, they will pay them. At least if they don't pay them, I know you, you're a child of God, they will pay you back. 
you'll get all your rights in Jesus' name. But you know, they, they are all fending for themselves and getting this and getting that. And somebody says, you know what now? I have another kind of job there. Another job, if this one does not bring in something, that other one won't bring. And uh, he says, how about you? And then you're asking, when do you, uh, when do, you do that work? How do you get time to do that? He says, uh, you know, Monday night, I go to that lesson. And uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, I go to that other place. And uh, Saturday, I go to that other place. And he says, I can make room for you because uh, you can teach. You can teach man, you can teach English. And I can tell all those families and they will call you. And apart from regular salary, you also get this and that. And uh, you say, but I can't hear my people. But none of these things move me. You'll not allow them to take you away from the work of God. This work, nobody will take you away from it. And uh, you will not drop it yourself in Jesus' name. Problems might come. Persecution might come. It's just temporary. All things we ask of God through the name of Jesus, he will give it unto us. He has given us Jesus Christ. He spared not his only begotten son, but he gave him for us. How much more then will he not freely give us all things? All those things are coming your way. And so don't be in a hurry and don't say, I don't have this, I don't have that. You'll have them in Jesus' name. That's why you commit yourself to the work of the Lord. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might tell me the word. I, might, I will finish. I said I will finish. You will finish well in Jesus' name. So that I might finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the, of the grace of God. You will prosper in the work in Jesus' name. Point number two now. Tell me point number two. The persuasion of the sinner's conscience. Here is where we're going to learn a lot from Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through this uh, chapter and then we'll see how Jesus persuaded the woman. And let's look at this to start with John chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 6. John chapter 4 verse 6. John chapter 4 verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat on the well. And it was about, tell me the time, it was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour. Do you know what the sixth hour means? Who knows? Sixth hour. When was that? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. 12 o'clock, because the Jews started counting their time, 6 o'clock in the morning. 6, 7 will be the first hour. 8 will be the second hour. 6 hour will be when? 12 o'clock. Learn something from that. This was a woman. And you know when Nicodemus came, Nicodemus came in the night. But in the case of this woman, it was in the afternoon and in the open. So that there will be no gossip about anything. Of course, Jesus knew that he is holy. He knows that he is righteous. He knows that he is uh, the very son of God. He couldn't do any evil. He could talk to anybody, anybody in the day or in the night. But... All the same, we must not leave room for suspicion and leave room for gossip and leave room for a good work to be evil spoken of. He met Nicodemus in the night, a man to a man. But now he was going to see this woman and it was in the day, in the afternoon, in the open. And then his disciples were not there. Can you think about that? And his disciples not being there, that was actually advantageous because, you know, if the disciples were there, there to start with talking to that woman and saying about her husband, you've married a five husbands, that woman will be ashamed. And so you see all the circumstances and all the situations. Number one, at the sixth hour in the open. Number two now, look at uh, verse seven. In verse seven, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus says unto her, tell me, Give me to drink. Uh, obviously, from the story you can tell, that woman would not have started the conversation because she said, 
you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And Jews and Samaritans do not have any sin in common. They don't talk together. If you're going to evangelize, you must initiate the conversation. You must touch the conversation. And you must touch on a familiar subject. Now, we come to Nicodemus again. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, ye must be born again. It was a kind of, for Nicodemus, a theological term. Even Nicodemus could not understand that. But in the case, of this woman, did Jesus say he must be born again? No, that would be too deep for her. But the woman understood water, the water of life. And so Jesus went from a simple language and from a known language, give me water to drink, and then the conversation went on. But the point is, he started with a familiar subject. You can start with a familiar subject, something your hearer will understand, something the prospect, that's the person you are talking to, something he will understand or she will understand. And let's look at uh, verse 9 in uh, John chapter 4, verse 9. Then said the woman of Samaria, unto him, how is it? That thou, being a Jew, hast cast drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have given uh, of him, have asked of him, uh, and he would have given thee living water. Hold on now. The woman asked a question. But Jesus controlled the conversation. Have you noticed that Jesus didn't answer the question? We don't answer every question. How oh, is it? You're a Jew. And then I am a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink of water? Jesus didn't answer that. Because if you wanted to answer that, he would have said, I'm asking you because of this, this, and this. But Jesus just avoided that question and carried on the conversation. You know what? He was in control of the conversation. He knew that he was going the direction of salvation. He wanted the woman to understand about the living water, about the water of life, about salvation, about coming to the kingdom of God. And the woman was ready for another question, a tribal question. It was ready for traditional question. She was ready for, you know, whatever it was, controversy. But Jesus kept on focused on the direction it was going. When you're witnessing to people, they will like to bring in uh, other things about politics and about a church and about this. And without shutting them up, you just go straight to what you want to talk about. And we're looking at verse 11 now. In verse 11 the woman says unto him because Jesus had said if you knew the person talking to you you would have asked him he didn't say it was Jesus he didn't say it was Christ he just said if you knew the person talking to you you would have asked and then he would have given her the living waters then the woman says unto him sir thou hast nothing to draw with now can you see how the, how the Lord Jesus kept her attention that she wasn't in a hurry because the conversation went on naturally and Jesus kept her engaged in that uh, conversation. Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with and the well is deep from whence hast thou this living water. By the way, in verse 12, art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well and drank um, thereof himself and his children and, and, his, and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said unto her, what's the question? I said, what's the question? In verse, uh, in verse 12, what's the question? Are you greater than Jacob? Give me that answer but before you tell me any other sin. Because you are talking about you are going to give me living water and the well is very deep and I can't, have, I can't see you have any rope or bucket that you let down and take the water. By the way, are you greater than Jacob? 
Now, if you wanted to answer the question, very easy. I even know the answer. And you know the answer. Was he greater than Jacob? Of course he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he was greater than Abraham. If he was greater than Abraham, it's greater than Isaac and greater than uh, Jacob. But did Jesus answer the question? No. no. You don't answer every question. You don't allow them to drag you into, how about this? How about this? Is your church better than Catholic church? Is your church better than Anglican church? Is your religion? Are you going to tell me that you yourself, you are greater than, you know, everybody else? You are telling me, born again, born again. Okay, you are born again and you are holier than everybody else. You don't have to answer that question. Just go on. Just go on and keep them in that conversation. They are going to be born again. Before they know what, you lead them to salvation. Look at verse 14. And, uh, but whosoever, uh, Jesus, verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. That's interesting. That's wonderful. I like to have that. Because if you'll never thirst after drinking the water you will give, what kind of water is this that will give you permanent satisfaction? And then you'll not be coming to the riverside. That's what she thought every time. And then look at what Jesus said. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water. You are coming to the well. I'll put the well inside you. And then there will be that well of water for satisfaction every time. Day and night, you have the well of water springing up into... I can't hear you. Everlasting, Everlasting life. Till you die and after you are dead, this water you are coming to carry here, you are coming to fetch here, only lasts for some time. And then you come again, and then you come again. But the one I'm going to give you will be springing up in you unto everlasting life. And you see that Jesus did not get into any argument. Because he was focused. You must be focused. The goal is not to win an argument. The goal is not to say, I have more knowledge than she has. The goal is not to say, you are a Samaritan, I'm a Jew, and I know more than you know. That's not the goal. The goal was to win the soul. If your goal is to win the soul, that's the thing to do. That's the thing to do. We're looking at verse 15 now. Uh, you see what we're looking at here, what we're tracing here? The wisdom of Jesus Christ. God will give you that wisdom. Number one, you're a woman, you're talking to a man, no problem, but do it in the open. Do it in a way that nobody will suspect anything bad. Or you're a man, you're talking to a woman, no problem, but do it in a way that nobody will, you know, be insinuating that uh, you're after something you know, that you are not actually thinking about. Number two, when you said, drink me, give me a drink, he started the conversation. He started the conversation. Number three, when he said, uh, how is he to a Jew? And you're asking me, a Samaritan. Uh, Jesus Christ focused on uh, the direction of his conversation. And then at uh, that greater than uh, Jacob, no argument. He just went on to tell her what she, he was going to supply. We're looking at verse 15 now. And the woman says unto him, sir, give me this water. Sir, Give me this water. Obviously, she didn't understand. She didn't understand about salvation, about the water of life. She didn't understand about uh, living above sin. She didn't understand about eternal life. But Jesus did not bother about that because Jesus was leading her to a point gradually and she will get there and the converts uh, we're talking to were leading them gradually and gradually and gradually they'll get to the point of conversion in Jesus name the woman says unto him sir give me this water that I thirst not neither come here to drink to draw neither come here to draw Jesus didn't say ah you're carnal you're thinking like a natural woman 
you miss the whole point. You think I'm talking about the water you are getting out of this well, and then you are telling me, give me this kind of water so that I'll not come over here again. But look at what Jesus said. And Jesus says unto her, tell me out loud, go call thy husband and come hither. You know, Jesus just went on in the conversation. He went on to lead the woman, go call thy husband. Verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. I have no husband. Jesus says unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he to whom this he is number what? Number six. number six. And he to whom thou uh, now thou now has is not thy husband. In that thou said truly. Uh, look at this now. When Jesus said, "Go call thy husband," he didn't insult her. He didn't say, "A big sinner." You're a wretched sinner. You're a dirty sinner. Well, we think we need to bring people to the march or the doors before we raise them up to the mountain top. Jesus never did that. Look at it, number one. Instruction without insult. Instruction without insult. She was getting to understand that she wasn't living right. Jesus was giving her instruction, but without insulting her. Number two, truth without torment. Truth without torment. Jesus was telling her the truth. And Jesus was leading her to the truth and bringing her out of a kind of a defiling ways, but without torturing her, without tormenting her, without casting aspersions on her. Number three, conviction without condemnation. Conviction. She came under conviction. She said, ah, go and call thy husband. I don't have any husband. You said the truth. It's not that she wasn't living with a man. She was living with a man. But she became convicted without condemnation. We're not there to condemn people. We're not there to, you know, kill them, club them in the head. Number four, persuasion without pressure. Persuasion. The Lord was persuading her without putting any pressure on her. Without saying, kneel down here. Repent over here. And then you, you must cry because you, you're very bad. You must go deep in repentance before the Lord can, you know, get rid of all these sins in your life. If you say you're praying, look at the lives you have lived. And look at this and look at this. If you don't roll on the ground, if you don't really cry and cry and show that you really want salvation, a person like you can never be saved. There was persuasion without pressure. Number five, recovery without reproach. Recovery. He recovered her from a life of sinning without any reproach on her, without any abuse. And this is water without warm wood. Water without one word. One word is a poison that is bitter. One word is something that you taste it like this, want to spew it out. But the water of life was coming without one word. Number seven, declaration without deception. He didn't deceive her. The truth, Jesus Christ is the truth personified. And Jesus told her the truth, but in such a way that the woman just, you know, was following along and flowing along. There was, there was no repelling uh, attitude. There was nothing about Jesus that showed that she was looking down on the woman. And we are not Jesus. We're Christians. We're born again. And we have received the grace of God. Well, the was and these people were preaching to why it not for the grace of God in our lives? That's the reason why we'll be gentle with the people, we'll go with the people and show them the grace of God. Uh, I come to another thing now. I'm coming to verse 19. Let's look at verse 19. And uh, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art, tell me, a prophet. Now you're going to find something here. Jesus gently led her, gradually guided her to the truth. First of all, he said, you're a Jew. 
That's all she knew when Jesus appeared the first time. And then later it's like a man, a man that told me everything. Later, sir, a Jew, that's general, like he called to every other Jew. But then she said, a man, not recognizing that this man has something. And then says, sir, and there was some respect now. It wasn't just a Jew, not just a man. This is sir. And now from Jew to man to sir, thou art a prophet. I perceive, I can tell, thou art a prophet. Is that not better than where she started? I said, is that not better than what she started? She was making progress. But still, she needs to understand being a prophet alone is not enough. And now, okay, the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said, I that speak unto you, I am he. Now she got to the point, it's not just a prophet, this Messiah. And then she left her water pot and went to the town and said, what did she say? Look at chapter 4, chapter 4, and look at uh, verse uh, 28. Chapter 4, verse 28, uh, 1, 2, 3, go everybody. What does she call her, him now? The Christ, the Christ. Even the Pharisees didn't know that. Even the Sadducees didn't know that. And it took a revelation from God uh, to Peter, to the apostles, before they even knew that. And then gradually, within a single conversation, a single conversation from a Jew to a man, from a man to sir, and from sir to a prophet, and from a prophet to Messiah, and then to not publicly declare you know, she had lost interest even in the in the water that she wanted to take there. She left her water pot and then everybody must hear this. She became saved and now she was going to become a soul winner. Come see a man that told me everything that I ever did. It's not this the Christ. She was transformed. I said she was transformed from a sinner to a saved soul. And then from a saved soul to a soul winner. If that could happen to that woman, it will happen to your converts. Yeah. And that is the persuasion of the sinner's conscience. I'm coming to point number three now. In point number three, the power of a single conversion. The power of a single conversion. Well, you know, sometimes uh, when we do counting, counting is good. Because, you know, there's counting in the New Testament. When Jesus fed the 5,000, there were some people there. We call them ushers now. They counted. It's good to count. And when he fed the 4,000, uh, there were ushers there. We call them ushers. They counted. They found 4,000. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, and, uh, you know, people gave their lives to the Lord, and there was counting, it was put on record. How many did we have on the day of Pentecost? Tell me. 3,000. But now, one single soul. One single soul. Sometimes, we get discouraged. When I say we, I say there are some people that get discouraged when they are preach and preach and preach and just one person comes to the Lord. They do not understand the power of a single conversion. This one, a single woman. This one, just one person. Only one. And Jesus got to her and she became born again. Look at the power of a single conversion. We're looking at a chapter, uh, chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 39. In verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him uh, for the sin of the woman. Many of the uh, Samaritans, many, not just a few, not believed because of the sin of the woman. We testified, he told me all that ever I did. 
because of her testimony, that single convert, because of her influence, that single comfort, because of the web of relationships with the many people she knew. It says, uh, they, This all came. Uh, look at verse 40. So, when the Samaritans were come unto him, uh, they besought him uh, that he would uh, tarry with them, uh, and he abode there two days, and many more believed. Many more believe everything coming out of the conversion of that single person because of his own words and said unto the woman, Now we believe. Not because, that means not just because of thy sin, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed who the Christ, the Savior, the Savior. Of the world as a result of that a single conversion you see the thing that took place there do you remember peter that's a single conversion too we're coming to acts of the apostles chapter 2 Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 and it's very important because uh, there was a time that Peter even denied Christ after he came to know the Lord and became a backslider but Jesus still reached out to him there are some backsliders who might just say well he knows the truth he's denying the Lord he knows the Bible if you deny me I will deny you and then we leave them like that in the field of backsliding but Jesus Christ followed after this uh, Peter and look at what this Peter did now the restoration of a single believer and the power of that single restoration we're looking at chapter 2 verse 30 then peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord our god shall call verse 41 then they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about, about 300 souls. That's the power of a single conversion, the power of a single restoration. Peter, just one man, one man that he now came to the point that he was fully restored, restored to salvation, restored to his sanctification, and then baptized in the Holy Ghost as a result of that single life. You see how many people became born again, then chapter 3, then chapter 4, then chapter 5, on and on. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 and we're reading from verse 26. Don't get discouraged. I have only one convert. That convert can turn a lot of other people to Christ and the Lord will multiply your fruit through your converts in Jesus name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 verse 26. Moreover you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul, that's another single convert, this Paul had persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. Only one convert, Paul the Apostle. And uh, so that's the reason why as we go out and we're reaching out. And then you say, I have one convert. Praise the Lord. That one convert can do a lot in Jesus' name. And when you think about Matthew, when Matthew came to know the Lord, he brought other publicans and sinners. He brought them to the Lord. You will do the same. Your converts will do the same. And because you will do the same, and your converts will do the same, great will be the uh, kingdom of God through us and through you, through me, through us together in Jesus' name. Now you see that this was a woman. And the result of the conversion of this woman, you see the result. Hey, let's come back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. If you can underline that, and if you can swallow that up, 
If you can think about that, if you can personalize that, if you can say that will be the motor in my life, the principle in my life, and the power in my life, the passion in my life, that my meat will be my satisfaction, my delight, the thing that satisfies me, and the things that fill me up, my meat, my food, my satisfaction, my fulfillment, will be to do the work of him that sent me, and to finish his work, say not ye. There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Don't say, I have uh, four months to complete a master's degree, and then I'll get involved. I have uh, four months to look for money by all means, and finish that house and building, and then I'll come to the evangelism. I have four months, I have four years, I have days and that to do, and then I'll come. But behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth, receiveth wages the Lord will reward you. Amen. He will pay you back more than you ever thought in Jesus' name. Everything you leave to do the work of God, the Lord will multiply by 100 and get it back to you in Jesus' name. And gather it fruit unto life eternal that both he that, that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Herein is that same fulfilled one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap. That whereon ye bestowed no labor. All the men have labored, and ye are entered into their labor. I pray you'll uh, labor significantly for eternity in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, chapter 6 of John. John chapter 6. And I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse 26. Jesus said unto the, just answered them, and said, Verily I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. He said, you are looking after, you are running after me because of, you know, having this and having that. But look at the counsel and the commandment you give, labor not for the meat which perisheth. Labor not for those temporary things, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him as God the Father sealed. The Lord is calling us back to think about our lives again, and to think about the work of our hands, and to see what he did, so that by the grace of God, we will rise up and do the same. You will not be barren in the kingdom. You will not be fruitless in the kingdom. There are people like this woman of Samaria waiting uh, you know, on the crossroad. Or they are waiting uh, in your community. Or they are waiting uh, around you there. Open your mouth. In initiate the conversation. Start the conversation and move on in the wisdom of the Spirit of God. And great will be the success of your labor for the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer that all that we have learned about Jesus Christ reaching out to this woman and calling upon this woman to come for the water of life, the Lord will give you the same zeal and the same passion and the same earnestness that you'll say, yes, I'm going to talk to my neighbors. I'm going to preach to my neighbors. No argument, no superiority complex, nothing, whatever. I just want to tell them about Jesus Christ the Savior. They will come. They will come. They will come. They will repent. They will turn to the Lord. And great will be your reward, both here and eternity in Jesus' name. Let's pray to the Lord and pray with all your heart, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. And make sure you commit everything you've got to the Lord so that this work will prosper in our hands together.